Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jam Tea Podcast, where we spill the jams and spin the tea. And I fucked it up again, uh, but we're just gonna keep going on. That, that is, felt that felt the, purposeful. I won't lie. Yeah. It, it, you know, I, at this point, I feel like my brain just like it, it's locked in the place. It's a train going down some tracks, and it's just it's it's, it's like, the trolley problem, but for titles. Like on that episode of Game Grumps, where uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Aaron Aaron's doing the uh, one smart feller he felt smart thing. And he goes like, one fart, damn it. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> but today, joyously, good day today, because we're going to be talking about two brand new records from two artists. We're going to be talking about The Hum Goes On Forever, the new album by The Wonder Years, who we recently discussed on this channel. We talked about their album, The Greatest Generation, a few weeks past. So go check that out if you haven't. Uh, it'll in update you into our thoughts on this band a mm. bit more. And current. that was also our 100th record club as well. So a band that I feel like are quite important to us and maybe to our identity in some way. Where that more people should listen to and talk about. So Absolutely. I think it's only fair that we follow it up and, you know, just fucking go, go, go listen to them, you fucking heathens. We're also going to be talking about a uh, new acclaimed release from something musician Alex G. Uh, we're talking about his new album, God Save the Animals. Uh, I, I, I literally have no idea how to classify him. Uh, like fucking... <laughs> Are like he's, uh, Sufjan core. He, he's in. He's like an indie wunderkind, essentially. Like the dude. Yeah, is, indie, the dude is twenty nine. Indie rock. The dude is twenty nine. This is his tenth album. He's just like he, he, He's on some some fucking energy. Like he he he's very prolific, and he's like he's one of those artists where it's ve- like you're kind of hinting at. It's very difficult to sort of describe the appeal or even like attach yourself to why people connect to him and people who like him I feel like struggle to even explain that which I guess will be kind of one of the challenges for me a little bit later on but we'll get to it interesting artist uh very much a lot to talk about there and we're going to be talking about on our record club this week we're Mm -hmm. going to be talking about Screaming Trees album Sweet Oblivion sort of a uh, kind of tied to our previous record club on songs in the deaf are sort of the connective tissue being Mark Langren, who tragically passed away Mike, this year. Uh, Mike, who now? Who? Shut up! I don't want. I Mike, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Mike Lang 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 That's Lanigan? what I said. It's just it's <laughs> just Lanigan. A, I think we will go to bat for what should be considered as a canonized grunge classic. Absolutely. This week. Uh, so that'll be interesting to talk about. We've talked about like every, we talked to tons about like the big grunge acts, not just in our 1991 retrospective, but we also talked about like Vitology and, you know, uh, other shit. So I feel like this is a real uh, a coming home moment for us. We're talking about a, a bit of a left of the dial grunge album, but something that combines yeah. a lot of different elements that sort of feels like if you put all the other grunge artists in a blender, this is sort of what you would get. So we're going to be talking about that. And I mentioned we also did our record club for Songs for the Deaf that was this past week. So if you haven't seen that, go check that out. It's a good one. Yeah, check that shit out. All right. Uh, And as per normal, as per usual even, at this point, let's talk about what we've been listening to for the last seven days. Jake, what have you been listening to? In case you couldn't infer from my rather scattershot intro, um, I've not had the best week, frankly. Um, Some might call it horrible. Um, It started off with me getting a flat tire driving home from work and shit just did not improve from there. So I have been doing what else but indulging in some classic jams and tea, sad core comfort music all week, pretty much. Just like the a very odd assortment of artists to be sure but i feel like i just sort of exercised the extremes of my listening habits so i will start off with that uh this morning yesterday when you work with third shift these designating things become useless everything's just one long day uh i listened to of course what else does this podcast listen to 
than when they feel like shit, but brand new. Um, I listened to two projects from brand new, one being the leaked demos uh, that they released in, God, like 2016, I think like 10 years after it was actually like leaked or something. I don't remember the exact well but basically what happened was is that back before the devil and god came out um the devil and god was a different album i actually think it was called something different i think it was called like fighting my demons or something like that and the album was leaked and the band sort of scrapped it and then we got the devil and god there are some songs that are on those original recordings like uh luca or sewing season that do appear on that but those are like two of the only surviving tracks and it's very strange to get a peek into a sort of alternate universe where this was the that album for this band and i i never really like listened to it as a full project up until now just because i had sort of just dipped in and out of the songs not really treating it like a a proper thing um and it's very interesting just to see how different it is especially in regards to like the prototype of the devil and God was very much like, it, it's a very Iraq war album. It's a very post 9-11 album. There are lots of lyrical allusions to war, going off to war. Um, there's, I'm pretty sure the lyrics in Luca are changed so that like at the start, like Jesse says something about like having ashes in his hair, something along those lines. But point being is that this is a way more like rooted in its time project for the band so it's interesting to see how the writing kind of manifests on there um and like it, it's difficult to judge it as its own thing just because you don't know how much of it is fully realized even though most of these songs are pretty well fleshed out by the band thankfully it's got some highlights on here like uh some top tier top shelf songs like uh nobody moves uh an insanely like big instrumentally ambitious song for the band there's also something like brothers song one of my favorite brand new tracks and generally speaking and i also like the alternate version of luca it's it's very strange to listen to that song because like the opening of that track is basically exactly the same as the one that made it on the devil and god except like i've heard luca so many times that i can tell that the only difference between the two in the beginning is the fact that they're mic'd very differently and normally i don't notice things like that but it's something that's so deeply embedded into my brain that i was just like oh shit that sounds different but yeah it's it's a it's a good album it's i think it's more than just like a curio for brand new fans i would say that like if you're judging it as a record it doesn't quite you know bat it out with the best of them or anything but i probably like it slimly more than something like your favorite weapon which i still really like for the record uh it, it's just a little bit more uh quintessentially in keeping with this band's identity and uh it doesn't lose much from not being the the fully formed experience that it is uh but the album from theirs that i listened to that i haven't talked about on here yet i feel like since we started this podcast pretty much every brand new album has come up at one point or another uh just because you know we're sad motherfuckers we all talked about listening to the devil and god when august first got into them uh he talked about listening to deja uh i've brought up science fiction before so the album i listened to of course feeling like shit this week was daisy uh daisy is a curious record just because it's sort of I people like it now, but I would say that it was sort of the most divisive entry in Brand New's catalog, purely from the fact that it is the album that follows up the eternal Stone Cold classic that is the Devil and God are raging inside me. So of course, you're probably going to be unfavorably compared to that in some regard, and it doesn't help that Daisy is just a fuck ugly album, mm. like the, oh. just a just an ugly loud fucking angry album this is an, a record where it deliberately feels like brand new is like the, it's like they knew they had the devoted fan base that they did and they decided to test their limits as much as humanly possible mm -hmm. this album has like drums and snares that are like i mean they're industrial they're so rough they're so fucking loud and they and like 
half of the vocal performances on this album are just Jesse Lacey fucking screaming. And this isn't even like sewing season fucking like throw down post hardcore emo song kind of screaming. It's just kind of like, is this man okay? Like the, I think about- No. Um, no, nobody involved in the making of this album was okay. And it, it sort of preludes science fiction, a lot of some of the more like sonically dark directions they would go in. I think about the final minute of the song Gasoline very frequently because it is like, again, that is a, that's a great brand new song. Uh, one of the ones I've listened to the most from this record. I one of the best opening sets of lyrics to any song ever. You tried to start, or you tried to put the fire out, but you used gasoline. And I'm just like, yep, that's what I feel like all the time. Uh, but the final minute of that song is just like this harsh, abrasive collection of hell noise. It feels like you're listening to like a fucking Coil album. It, 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 it's deeply unsettling. And this album also has like weird diversions, like Be Gone, which is just like, I don't know what the fuck this is. This is just a minute and a half of weird shit where you can barely make out what Jesse's saying. The the panning of his voice is going back and forth all the time. And again, I, I can see why this was a bit of a challenging release uh, initially for some people, perhaps. It's an ugly album that sort of issues all sense of even like structure. Any possible way you can get along with an album like this, this album directly subverts by just mm. being like no fuck you um and I, I admire it more and more each time i listen to it it's it's in my opinion at least it is absolutely every bit as good as all of the top shelf material from this band uh it's got some songs on here like one of my favorite brand new songs period which is uh at the bottom which is like a, a, a yep. classic sort of like tune in my eyes like that's sort of just everything about like the melody and the drums in that are just so classic and timeless and there's also shit like you stole or <laughs> fucking sink or uh noro the closer which is nuts and also i cannot imagine what it must have been like to see this album released and then the opening track is fucking vices you just get that weird ass little religion fucking radio transmission and then you just get the fucking beat down of, of the rest of that one song. of one of the most like harrowing evil. jump scares in 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 any in any music i've ever heard thing about daisy evil is like it's like the musical equivalent of a snuff film like you just yeah, you, yes and the thing about it as a follow-up to devil and god as well is like you know, this comparison is maybe it's either too obvious or it's like too uh, much of a reach. I don't actually know, but like I, I see the brand new's progression honestly as really being, you know, within the terms of what confounds of what they do, as being kind of analogous to the Radiohead progression, at least for the first four albums, right? Like no, because that makes sense. Because to me, like your favorite weapon is the Pablo Honey, Deja is the Benz, Devil and God is the OK Computer. I mean on like in, in multiple different senses in terms of how these albums build and kind of uh, elaborate the sound that these incredibly talented musicians are kind of constructing and kind of more and more confidently executing and then daisy is kind of like the kid a in a certain sense because it completely just like you have this sense of momentum with those first three brand new albums where each one is building off of the last one and then daisy yeah. is like it's like you know it's like hearing leaked demos like for, it is like hearing something that is not finished and could never be like it's it's a complete sidestep while still kind of being true to a lot of what the band you know sound like and do but it, it, it's deliberately shoddy and messy like the the sound of it is really great but it's like also almost also kind of like deliberately mixed and produced in a way to be like as abrasive and kind of like off-putting as possible uh there's everything about the album is like it's a calculated decision made to make it a difficult follow-up to essentially a widely yeah. lauded record and it, it's an album that kind of like you know it it, it kind of it dares you to like have an opinion on it essentially it dares you to kind of like have, have a take about it because it's kind of like one of those records that feels like ultimately unknowable and i i don't i yeah i can't 
I, 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 I can barely listen to it, let alone talk about it. Like it's a really just, it's a tough album for me. I, I would say it's even more like if Radiohead started with the Benz and Daisy is their amnesiac. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can see I, it. I, I can see that too. Honestly, it's 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 dark in a lot of the same ways. It's like I I can see it being somewhat frustrating in the same ways. But as somebody who didn't really like grasp onto the narrative of brand new when I got into their music, I just sort of listened to Daisy as another brand new album, and as such, it's never had the identity of being like a, a breaking the mold album for me. It's just like it has its appeal of being brand new's angriest album and like it really just depends on either what mood you're in or what kind of person you are in in terms of like what's their darkest album because like conceivably it could be devil and god it could be science fiction or it could be this but if you ask me right now i'd probably say daisy because it's it it, it fully commits to not giving a shit about the listener so thoroughly that like and like everything about the the guitar tones on here just swallow everything it's just it, it is something you have to be in a deeply deeply bad mood to listen to even more so than the other stuff which like you know i can listen to devil and god when i am sad i can listen to science fiction when i am when i feel particularly empty or whatever and you can there are intense parts of those albums but i can still kind of go with the flow with them whereas daisy is very much like an album i consider to be just as good as those but one that i i have listened to significantly less it's like the album i think of a lot when i listen to it is nirvana's in utero like it to me it, it has a similar sound yeah. palette and a kind of approach to how the whole band's identity and sound are kind of like you know made they really lean into the unfriendliness and they kind of like try to strip away a lot of you know the the pop punk roots essentially um and like they both oh, have yeah. they're both records where like the snare sound like someone is beating a like a, a just a bag of flesh uh it's just a really uh mm. just uncomfortable sound and and it, it, that's the the kind of like this the snuff film analog that i was making before in a certain sense that you hear it and you feel like this is the product of suffering that like not just like internal suffering but like you know someone had to hurt someone to make this uh you yep. know not not that i want to yeah. get into you know any more of the yep. implications of that but like just uh, divorced from the actual people involved in it it just sounds that way you just listen to this record and it sounds like you know i need i listen to this and i'm like i need to not develop a relationship with this because it won't be healthy yeah. for me. It, it's, <laughs> too a, it's, fucking a cursed, it's a too fucking cursed latest, fucking right. object, but um, I, I completely get that. For, whereas like, like every other brand new record, I can like enjoy on the level of, you know, a really great sort of emo adjacent pop punk yeah. you know, sort of record. I can just take them on, the, on those merits. Whereas this is the album that kind of like just refuses to let you kind of enjoy it on a, on a really kind of just base musical level it just completely just tries to get in the way of that constantly and i, I actually really admire records like that I, and especially when it's a band that have you know already proved themselves so they can just make a record like this uh and, and essentially say fuck you uh and you'll you'll fucking you know you'll, you'll be grateful for it the other go-to sad boy shit i listened to this week is that you can accurately measure how bad I feel based on how much folk music I listen to. Um, so a lot of my listening this week has been to the records of one of my, I now consider them a favorite band, but a band that I've certainly loved since basically the inception of this podcast because of a record Riley recommended to me. And that's uh, the discography and the band, uh, Ockerville River. Um, I listened to Black Sheep Boy, I think like right before the podcast started and like really loved that album. And then I listened to their debut, Don't Fall in Love with Everyone You See. And that album has stood the test of time as being one of my favorite albums ever, uh, a perfect record in my own estimation, an album that gets comparatively a little bit less attention. But, oh man, I love that album so much. It's... Uh, it sort of explores, it's less conceptual than Black Sheet Boy, so I can certainly understand why people wouldn't look on it as fondly as that one, and I do love Black Sheet Boy basically as much, uh, but I just, 
it's a it's very much a plans and transatlanticism dichotomy where i i just enjoy the songs on don't fall in love a little bit better it opens up with stuff like red one of my favorite songs it has westfall which is like if you made a murder ballad about the kid that Tommy Lee Jones talks about at the beginning of No Country for Old Men. It's basically a story told from his point of view um, and is suitably fucked up and bangery. Uh, that, that's one sort of underrated part of Ockerville River's sort of discography as a whole is that they can get really dark, uh, thematically speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, that, that also has uh, probably what I would consider to be one of my favorite, 20 favorite songs ever, which is uh, listening to Otis Redding at home during Christmas, which is just like the coziest, comfiest song ever made by anybody. And it's just like, man, I moved into a new apartment and I listened to something like this. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm, I miss home so much uh it's it's a it's a wonderful wonderful record that more people need to hear uh i love it dearly but i i've also been listening to their whole discography really just because i feel like at one point i want to find a way to talk about this band uh maybe in a similar way to what uh riley did with uh the radio department maybe i'll make a top 10 ockerville river songs one day or maybe i'll do a discography video on them lord knows they deserve it um but i've also listened to basically like everything in their initial run their sophomore effort down the river of golden dreams which is like a band that i never see compared to this band is the mountain goats and i don't know why because they are like the appeal and overlap circle if you like the mountain goats you'll like this band and down the river of golden dreams is the most mountain goats album of ockerville river to the point where there are songs on here where uh like for example the velocity of saul at the time of his conversion how is that not a john darneal song title like that's no also one of the fucking best songs the band ever made by the way but also uh songs like the war criminal rises and speaks like again why is that not a song on transcendental youth i don't know uh, but that is also a terrific album. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, the their third album, Black Sheep Boy, which is just terrific and also has its anniversary release, which sort of staples their EP, the Black Sheep Boy Appendix, onto that, which uh, I may or may not talk about in the future as being one of my favorite EPs. Um, but I highly recommend listening to that just because it combines all that together. And if you want to listen to Ockerville River, Black Sheep Boy is probably where you should start, even mm-hmm. though a lot of people consider that their sort of magnum opus high point. I would still say it's just it contains everything about the band that you might need to know. It's it's mm-hmm. also like they're certainly a folk rock band. And later, like once they I feel like get bigger, they pursue a sort of like heartland rock sound. But there's like this music has deep ties to emo like inextricably to the point unquestionably the first, yeah the first three ockerville record uh right that ockerville river records are emo albums uh mm. through and through um it, it diminishes a little bit after that but certainly the appeal is still there um like on the stage names and the stand-ins which are the two albums that follow black sheep boy which i think are deeply underappreciated records uh the stage names in particular i think is sensational um again they sort of pers- you can feel this band and like will chef like just actively pursuing wanting to become bigger and i feel like the band just never properly found its audience because this is certainly these are albums that like a band would tour with uh to the point where like i love the stand-ins but that's an album that suffers from the fact that like a lot of the songs are written from the point of view of like an entertainer or a musician to the point where, you know, you're like, this album was written by someone who was touring at the time. Uh, And it's mileage is limited a little bit by that because it sort of is, it's limited more by the fact that it has less to to talk about and explore than their earlier records, but is no less musically fun and spry. Uh, I still have to get to records like I Am Very Far or The Silver Gymnasium and I do want to re-explore Away. But curiously enough, the album of theirs that I found most interesting in my sort of delving into them is their final record, In the Rainbow Rain, which is by far their least acclaimed record, the record that the people seem to like the least. And um, no, 
Uh, most notable thing about this album is that it is produced by the boy, Sean Everett. And man, it sounds like, God, this album sounds like a million fucking bucks. It is so, like, you can tell it's, again, him pursuing that larger Heartland Rock Springsteen adjacent sound. But again, it's produced by Sean Everett. So this is an Ockerville River album that sounds like the war on drugs. I don't know how people aren't into that shit because I certainly am. Um, it's a really consistent record too. It starts off with a song I love called Famous Tracheotomies, which is um, like Chef is talking about how he was like, I think he was born prematurely and he had to be have a tracheotomy as a child. And then he proceeds to go on and tell the stories of other famous people who have had tracheotomies and the circumstances under which they had them. Like, uh, I think Roy Davies of the Kinks is someone he mentions. And that's how that experience led to him writing a song while he was in the hospital after he uh, like was sick. Um, uh, there was like a Motown singer who like, I think like Ella Fitzgerald chipped in to see if she could like help her or uh, like with like the, the cost for the surgery. And it's just like a really ambitious, really specifically weird song that goes into this very, like connecting all of these various different people. And the whole album is just really good. It, it doesn't have like the striking consistency of the earlier records. There are a couple songs on here like don't move back to la or external actor that i don't find as like lyrically compelling as the rest of the stuff but this just goes to show you if you're exploring the discography of a band don't let the general consensus deter you from exploring records in specific bands canons because you might end up really enjoying them i i can i i guess that the reason an album might be received like this is because people are just like, they sold out and went pop or whatever. And I'm guessing that it's like, oh, it's a betrayal of their folk rock roots. And I'm just like, whatever, man, it sounds great. Shut the fuck up. Uh, I think so, with, with bands like Ockerville River, people just kind of lose interest when the bands that yeah. ceases, ceases to be something that they something very specific that they fell in love with. And I don't even blame yeah. people. Like I get it, to be honest, to a certain extent. And then with someone like, you jake where it's like you're kind of coming in you know at a point where the whole discography just kind of exists and you can kind yeah. of just jump into any point of it at any point you're not like kind of getting hooked in on one album that sort of defines your life for years before you get another one from them you kind of have the benefit of getting the full overview and getting to kind of like treat every record oh, yeah. equally uh, whereas I think a lot of people with these 2000s indie bands, like there's just a nostalgia and attachment for what they were and what they meant to you at a particular time in your life. And then the as you get older and they change and you change and you kind of just sort of drift away from that. But I, I, I actually admire the way that Will has kind of shifted into this sort of more polished sort of Americana adjacent, sort of more kind of like gentler uh, realm. Like it reminds me a lot of... Uh, artists like you know from that era like bonnie prince billy and the decemberists as well who did had a kind of similar December progression Burists. uh and then there's artists now like wild pink for instance and you know and the war on drugs to a certain extent as well who are like kind of leaning more in towards the sort of almost ambient kind of like drifting meandery sort of like vision of you know what i kind of tend to think of as kind of like post heartland <laughs> almost but anyway i haven't dug into a lot of the later I, i've haven't i've heard heard bits and bobs here and there but i need to i would like to spend some time with some of those later records because i think i might enjoy them i think you would too i think a lot of people would i think that maybe Ockerville river just because it was a departure for them and because it was a little bit earlier than some of those other bands they just they just never properly found their audience. And it's a shame just because if you pushed their career forward by about five years, I think they probably would have been a lot more successful in the long run. But yeah, Ockerville River has been a source of, of comfort for me, uh, as well as another folk artist who I we've mentioned, we've covered this person uh, on the podcast before, but that being Phil Elverum. Um, I listened to Mount Erie's Dawn this week, uh, multiple times, in fact. Uh, which again tells you the headspace that I've been in. And uh, this album is cool because for one, it is just Phil and a guitar. Like 
even the production on this album like the biggest production decision on here is the fact that there are occasional vocal harmonies that are you know obviously applied in post but that's like it it is just this man with a guitar singing and i it's really tough to call it but like right now if you ask me what my favorite phil project was microphones mount erie all of that uh taken into account i might tell you that one i need to re-explore like basically everything and there are a couple like like i haven't heard uh mount erie like the the, the microphones album mm -hmm. i haven't heard um it was hot so we stayed in the water uh mm -hmm. just there the odds and ends that i haven't gotten to yet um but like right now i would say that dawn might be my favorite this is one of the, my favorite albums i've listened to this year just because like I can certainly understand why somebody would be underwhelmed by this just because it is so stripped back and plain, but like the production choices still like the guitar sounds so warm and Phil's voice is so weathered and he's just such a good fucking writer. Like I, he almost forces you to interrogate everything that he sings about to the point where like I, I like I almost felt like held hostage by this album like I needed to listen to it multiple times to unpack uh parts of it and I think the most interesting thing about it is that it's sort of like Dawn is most comparable sonically speaking and even kind of mood wise to uh A Crow Looked at Me uh in that this is an album that's very stripped back and was made in the wake of the dissolution of a relationship and phil hold himself up in the cabin in the middle of nowhere and made this album it's so and... funny because i'm pretty sure it came out the same year as the like the canonical example of that which is bernie vera's first album as well 2008 that... was really like a year for like uh white dudes in a cabin after a breakup being incredibly Heart sad and broken. writing writing these eternal and, songs <laughs> and it's like the opposite of that in many respects because i feel like bonnie Vare is like it's very you know it's very ornate it's very beautiful that kind of like his music is super lush whereas phil's is super stripped back but it's so comforting all the same like i that's what kept me coming back to this is that even though a lot of moments on this album tear right into your rib cage and squeeze on your heart. It's difficult to sort of isolate parts of this album just because it's it's such a like a lot of the song lengths are a little bit more scant, like two and a half minutes. So it's just, I just kind of digest it as one whole thing, like microphones in 2020. And there are just parts like he talks about, I've been told I have exceptionally smooth skin. But what good is that when you have to crawl through a tunnel of broken glass to get to my heart? And you're just like, oh dude oh, fucking jesus <laughs> fuck me that's brutal stop <laughs> and like and there's also a song on here where it's like he talks about like approaching this thing that's like in the middle of nature that's like going to speak to him and he goes and it said and then the music stops and it's like dead silence for a minute and you're just kind of like did could what did it, what did it fucking what did it say phil and you're just you kind of digest that moment as being like it's kind of initially uh, somewhat terrifying but it's just like am i supposed to hear my own version of this in sort of uh -huh. like is it sort of like a transference is it sort of like am i supposed to be imagining what phil is saying or is this just supposed to be and i heard it say and then it said nothing back to him and that kind of very basic utilization of song structures in just like a very concrete way makes for an album listening experience that feels quintessential to Phil but also just feels like it's just an album that's deeply relatable I feel like I'm in that cabin in the middle of the woods when mm. listening to this which I think is the appeal of Phil's music is that whenever I listen to it I always feel like I'm connected to nature in some respect like all of my other favorites of his like Clear Moon for example is another one where it's just like I feel like I'm connected to the universe when i listen to this man speak so yeah. I, i've kind of formally now consider mount erie to be one of my favorite bands just because i feel like i've loved so many of his projects and but it, Phil, phil's music's been hitting particularly hard lately i love dawn for a lot of reasons uh for starters like it's it's not even really like an album properly like it's more of a collection of song fragments like I, yeah I, the, listening to this like it is you've got to kind of 
you know, approach it on its own terms. Like it's if you start criticizing a record like this for, you know, the songs, you know, aren't fleshed out enough or they kind of end too quickly for me, it's kind of like you're sort yeah. of missing the whole point of it. Like the whole point is this is a collection of fragments. Like it's subtitled The Winter Journal, right? So it is, yes. it's kind of like reading someone's journal, right? You have these different fragments of thoughts from different little moments in this period, in this sort of season of their life, essentially. And it has like, uh, depending on whether you're listening to or looking at the original pressing or the reissue it has two different covers and i love them both the original cover is kind of like it's the the title of the album is just embossed on this kind of like wooden yeah. surface and it looks like it, it really kind of sets you in that kind of like cabin environment and then the reissue cover is like this really sort of stripped back you know blank white um backdrop and just the entire lyrics of the whole album are just printed yep. on the front cover and it's kind of like that really emphasizing that journal aspect as well it's also worth noting that this came out like about a month after the uh lost wisdom album that he made with julie Duaron yeah. and fred squire another project i love and it's one i love too and actually uh, a number of songs on this record are actually also on that record in a different version yeah. with those collaborators kind of fleshing them out and like so there's like an interesting kind of connective dna between those two projects and they're like for as much as this is just like you know it's it's about 20 songs and they're all sort of fragments and they all kind of just sort of blur together to a certain extent somehow still there are standouts like there are songs that i will always like that have always sort of stuck with me that i consider like individually amazing achievements for phil songs oh, yeah. like moon sequel like i say no um with my hands out which is my favorite song on lost wisdom and it's great here as well yeah great ghosts which i think is one of phil's best songs ever uh the famous voice in headphones which is the song where he interpolates yeah uh, bjork's undo i think is the song he interpolates it's something off of vespertine uh in songs like who and climb over and my burning like just there's just, it yeah these are really unassuming and kind of like initially maybe even underwhelming if depending on what your expectation for this is but i also think that if you're you know if you come at phil's career like treating something like the glow part two as a kind of like you know rosetta stone almost that makes it a little bit easier to interrogate and accept records like this because the glow part two is kind of like it's the best of both worlds right it's the fully yeah. formed you know master's piece songs and it is also the fragments that color it out and fill out the rest of it and it feels like a continuous journey and it sort of sets the stage for a lot of what phil does on his records um in the sort of eras to follow right and i yeah dawn is like it's really unassuming it's a record that kind of it might just kind of fly over you the first time you hear it but it is like one of those things where you kind of keep coming back to it and i've been listening an awful lot this week surprise fucking surprise to adrian linker and i feel like she yeah. makes records particularly in her solo work she makes records really similarly to how phil makes records yes. on and, and albums like this where it's like it's almost deceptively unassuming and the songs are like ridiculously simple but the more you kind of have them in your life and the more you kind of like just listen to them and think about the beautiful lyrics the kind of more they just sort of take root inside of you and you just kind of oh, like oh yeah. you can't shake them they're like something that just attaches itself to you like an infection like but you just can't get rid of it and it's it suddenly starts to kind of take over your identity and you start to you know commune like with the albums in question and start to kind of like start to feel like an extension of you in a weird way morgan what do you want to shout out this week little little band from the french canadia uh called gurgits what would you what, cool what now C colored sand it's the it's the best gore guts album it's just yeah, it's just, it's just yeah. Christ. you're saying Whoa. things i agree with it's just it all came together correct yeah uh flawless album that also just happens to have like a fucking bernard herman musical interlude yep and you like need that shit because if it doesn't exist, you'd just be like, by the time you're done, you'd be like, oh, fuck, gee, oh God, my fucking colon, it's been damaged permanently. Fuck. The, the fucking, it, the first time I heard that, the Battle of Shamda, I was like, okay, cool. We're getting them some strings here. And I was just waiting for the fucking, you know, for the other shoe to drop. And then it was like, Psych! 
realize the whole song was going to be this and then i infinitely respected it even more and i just like this is awesome just committing and having this like Inter- this really ornate interlude and then like once you get you're on your fifth list and you start to appreciate how it like you know it gives the whole like operatic narrative of the album like it gives it a, a central point and yeah it's that shit is like that that i mean not only is it a perfect album in the sense that every fucking second of it sounds amazing but also like it is like it's everything an album should be like it, it's got like yeah just dense fucking like stories and and shit and like all this sort of it it's 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 a fucking like it's a rich text yeah that's 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 something i was going to was going to say as well every gorgut's album has been a controlled deliberate assault in the best way possible and colored sands is that but it also feels like an odyssey like it is it is a journey and it feels holistic Mm. and it's it crashes so the last thing i want to mention is actually a sort of music and film hybrid type of thing because in the lead up to the release of andrew dominic's blonde on netflix this week i watched his two nick cave documentaries slash performance concert films uh one more time with feeling and this much i know to be true respectively uh double featured them you got to be somewhere to be able to do that like you got to do some prep work internally they they are both like oh god and yes especially when you double them the latter of which feels like an absolute fucking soaring triumph like a like a stop making sense type of auditory visual fucking mind explosion moment there's a there's a part when they're playing white elephant and it transitions into the really big choral part at the end of that song. And the camera's just going ape shit and the framing and the blocking and the performance is just like the most goaded shit I've ever heard. And I felt, I don't know what I felt. There's not a word for that emotion. The non-musical parts of this much I know to be true are like super Dominic, like the way that he kind of like frames and like the things he includes in terms of what Nick talks about, you know, the fucking 10 minute scene of him showing yeah. off his satanic this is, pottery. This is uh, called Devil as Child. <laughs> it's so good. Um, but then like the actual musical parts, like the way that Dominic and Robbie Ryan shoot them. It's almost like a fucking Terrence Malick movie. Like it's just genuinely fucking. There's a divine energy that radiates. It doesn't. It doesn't hurt as well that all the songs are from either Ghost Teen or Carnage. So you just there's some of the most like yeah. fucking spiritually transcendent music already that Nick has ever made. And it's just like it's. I I, I watch that film and I'm like I'm I'm hearing one of the greatest artists of the last 100 years performing his best work and doing it better than he's ever done it somehow like it, it, it's just it, it's a, it feels like it's so it shouldn't be something i can see for free although i guess i'm i'm, yeah. I'm, I'm downloading it illegally so it's technically yeah. not something i can see for free but i fucking did so what eat me yeah just- and, and it's very much a similar thing for uh, one more time with feeling although that's much more of a documentary with these performance pieces stitched in because uh, that's a, a black and white documentary and shot by, by motherfucking Benoit Devier. Yeah, it's a good point. It, it couldn't, it can't really be emphasized enough. The aesthetics of those two films are very different. So like anyone who's like, oh, what do we need another one of these for? Like, you know, they're incredibly different experiences and they do not feel redundant with each other at all. Imagine complaining about getting more art from Nick Cave. Could not be me. And and Andrew, oh, well. (laughs) uh... 
All right. As for what I've been listening to this week, I have a few things I want to shout out. Uh, first of all, is I listened to, I discovered a really interesting and I think really, really cool new jazz record from an artist called Makaya McRaven. Uh, he is an incredibly talented jazz drummer and band leader as well. And he released a new record this week called In These Times that is absolutely fantastic like I think some of the best I one of the things that I'm kind of trying to make one of my little sort of sub goals for the rest of this year is to really kind of listen to as much jazz as possible from this year I've shouted out a couple of jazz records already that I think are really really great standouts this year particularly the Binker and Moses album Feeding the Machine which still really really highly recommend to anyone who wants to hear some of what jazz is what's happening in the world of jazz at the moment but this new Mackay and McRaven album is excellent as well I think um possibly uh my favorite of the jazz records that I've heard so far this year uh highly highly recommend it it's a really tight 40 minutes uh for a jazz record as well it's very peppy it's very fast paced uh the band are super in lockstep as well uh, some of the arrangements are you know I won't call them progressive that's a bit of a stretch but they do kind of go a little bit you know, they're, they're very exploratory and expansive in a way that never loses your attention. So Mackay and McRaven in these times, you want a 40 minute jazz hit um, just to put on while you're doing whatever. Can't recommend that enough. Also listen to the new album from The Comet Is Coming, Hyperdimensional Expansion Beam. Uh, another fascinating and exciting record from one of the most thrilling jazz projects that are currently operating today. As well, of course, uh, the brainchild of one Shabaka Hutchings as well who is like one of the most prolific and talented jazz musicians of the last 10 years as well uh, what's really fascinating about this new Comet is Coming record is the way that it incorporates electronic dance sounds into the jazz yeah aesthetic in a way that I totally was not expecting from Comet is Coming especially after no, how, like sort of psychedelic and sort of you know rich and sound the your amazing last record was which is one of my favorite albums of 2019 uh, but this is a really quite an interesting know. step and it's kind of like it's almost like elements of new disco elements of house music but like the the jazz instrumentation in particular Shabaka's saxophone is so front and center constantly like it's always driving these songs and you get this real sort of like a symbiosis between what Shabaka's doing and the synthesizer work as well it's that's like happening a on jazzy the space rave it's yeah really exactly funny. it's just like it would really... make for a cool pairing with the most recent avalanches yeah absolutely it's got like it's just it, i would never predict myself saying one of the year's most remarkable and interesting dance records is also a jazz album but here it yeah is. right so, uh listen to this it, like the the real dance here stuff i think is like more front loaded and then as you go on you get a little bit more um focused and on uh more on grooves that are more driven by the traditional ensemble but still that pulse uh, and that kind of sense of momentum is always there as well. So both the Mackay and McRaven and Common is Coming albums are great jazz records from the last couple of weeks that really, I really, really will keep your attention and sustain it for the run times. And I can't recommend them enough. I also want to shout out an album from a singer songwriter who has been around for a very long time uh, and who has always, I felt, never quite gotten her flowers for the unique voice that she has and the compelling sort of songwriting that she's able to put together. This being the artist Beth Orton, who I think is best known for her collaborations with the Chemical Brothers. Uh, she sings uh, on, famously sings at least one song on, I think, their first five or six records. Uh, she sings uh, on Dig Your, Own so uh, Dig Your Own Hole, she sings on the song Where Do I Begin, and she sings on a number of uh, um, of my favorite Chemical Brothers songs, and so she's always been like a voice that's been a part of my childhood because of how much I've always loved that band, um, but she, ha she has a great solo career of her own, her 1999 album Central Reservation is a really, really great uh, singer-songwriter record, uh, but her new album, uh, first album in six years, I think, is called Weather Alive, uh, came out last week, uh, fantastic singer songwriter record like really kind of brooding and intimate uh, but also really really beautiful and she has this and I'm using this word I guess uh, not just because it, it it's part of the title but also just because it is the best way of describing her voice she sounds withered like this is the sound of you know it's the sound of a woman who has lived a life to a certain extent like it's it's kind of the midpoint between like someone like Sharon Van Etten um but with a kind of emotional potency of someone like I don't know Amy Bridgers why not let's just throw it out there uh, just that kind of singer-songwriter vision 
And I think that people who appreciate that aesthetic that's so commonly now and so defined by like, you know, Gen Z and uh, younger millennial artists who want to hear people who want to hear that aesthetic, but through the, you know, the, the lens of someone who's lived a life essentially and has been around a while and has this really kind of mature sensibility to the way that they compose music will really enjoy this new Beth Orton album. I, I thought it was fantastic. And I uh, thoroughly, it's just, it was an absolutely immaculate vibe as well as having just really, really great songwriting and exceptional production as well. Um, she's an artist that I think that people have kind of forgotten about, um, especially since she kind of stopped collaborating with the Chemical Brothers and sort of her solo career hasn't really uh, generated much buzz uh, in a long time. But this new record is, it's just eight songs, uh, 45 minutes. The songs really have enough, give themselves enough space to breathe and they are beautiful. And so I highly recommend that. Uh, really, really good album. Um, I'll also shout out that I, <laughs> I listened to the new Weezer EP, uh, Seasons, oh. Autumn. So I guess if you've been a regular listener to the show, I, I, I'm pretty sure I will have talked about the previous installments of this series, uh, which I both hate and they're really bad. Spring is dreadful summer is somehow worse and then autumn is just hilariously the nadir so far like this is so funny to me how this series and it may just be that i'm like you know I, no matter what it is i'm just gonna like each what each release less and less because it's just more of it uh so but no i actually do think this is like on some I'm not going to say objective because that's you know stupid word to use but like on some measurable metric i i do believe this is the worst uh installment in this series so far uh but it, it is also to its credit probably the most memorable one so far in that it has mm. moments of true you know atrociousness that are just like you will remember them when you hear them. Like uh, there, there's songs on here that are just so just asininely. <laughs> As the series has gone on, I think like we, and this is kind of a, a trend with Rivers in the last few years. He's, he's gotten really, really into like his Baroque influences, right? He like has been listening to a lot of classical music. He's been trying to write a lot of string arrangements and stuff. He's trying to been trying to like push Weezer in this direction of having a little bit more of a like, you know, of like a kind of, rootsy sort of power pop sound i guess Leave i don't know the valdi alone and, and yes and there is the song uh tastes like pain on here where he uh essentially the, he oh, he samples the incredibly famous uh autumn section of Vivaldi's four seasons uh like it, just one of the most recognizable pieces of antonio classical. was barely cold one of the most recognizable pieces of classical music in the whole world and the way he fucking forces a vocal melody on top of this, and just, oh, it's so fucking bad. It's like it's new levels of garish, even from Mr. Rivers Cuomo. Um, and the it's ego like it's required. not even like easily the huh. most garish or terrible moment on this record as well. Like the the elements of this album where he tries to like and find his groove. You know, songs like Can't Dance, Don't Ask Me, the just horrifically bad What Happens After You, which maybe has one of the three or four worst uh, hooks that Re Rivers has ever written. And we're talking like gratitude core bad. Like, listen, it's, it's hilarious how like just how much of a shrug this is. And one of the things I find interesting about like Rivers' process now, and I think you two will find this funny, is that like uh, more recently, he has been more actively involved in his fan Discord server. Like he's an actual active participant in his mm. fan's Discord server, which is just generally not advisable for any artist, but whatever, let no. it slide. Uh, but like the point is, he's like actively seeking feedback from his fans and like making creative decisions based on what his Discord thinks would be good for the song. And so you're having this interesting sort of collaborative process where Weezer's fan base are having input on how the music sounds and on the directions that the songs go in. And I just, I love this because to me, like, this is so ripe for like, um, this is so ripe for like corruption, like, or for, for this being like co-opted to... <laughs> Although I don't know, to be honest, how you could like make Rivers embarrass himself any more than he already has with his music. But like, I love the idea that 
<laughs> a bunch of ever... irony poisoned zoomers are dictating the future of this band it's just such a funny like new wrinkle in the you know can the never-ending the you know exhausting story of weezer now is <laughs> the the fact that he's writing songs with these fucking, you know, these fucking 17-year-old irony poison kids who are telling him that, oh, he, mm, no, more, more fucking, you know, just here, like, he, I, I, I mocked this up in Ableton for you, like, you know, tell me what you think. <laughs> I don't, I don't know the extent to which it actually, you know, you know, informs what we're hearing on the EPs. But I do know that he has said it's now a part of his creative process as being, you know, very like, you know, involved in this fan community. And, you know, that's, I'm, I'm sure for the fans, that's awesome, amazing. Um, but it is like, it's an interesting little, it's an interesting little thing that kind of represents how like more and more any tangible connection to artistry that Rivers may have ever had is like just, completely being eroded like you know how <laughs> the idea that he would be you know that he would consider himself an artist and be like you know working and composing collaboratively with just his audience is like i'm not going to get on my high horse about this but it's just it's just really funny how like it's just one of a million new things to just completely undermine his credibility as a creative you know person it's just really funny and anyway, I, I feel like on some level, they probably know that too. And that's part of the, the, the bit here, which is just even more exhausting. Yeah, like Weezer, Weezer is like kind of ceasing to be a band and it's more sort of starting to become a community. <laughs> which is- That's terrifying. It's dire, right? It's just, it's, it's haunting. <laughs> Last thing I'll talk about in my segment today is uh, a new album from an artist that ha has been discussed in this segment before by myself and by August, uh, an artist that we both enjoy uh, on, uh, a yes. on a particular level that's kind of difficult, I feel like, to clearly communicate in the sense that I don't think either of us really think that this artist is all that ha has really ever been all that good. But nevertheless, there's this weird attraction that we have to them. I think more so for Every me time well. you've ever brought them up, you're like, yeah, they suck. Anyway, I've listened to everything they've ever made. <laughs> like they don't, I don't actually even think that they suck. And this kind of gets into my new thoughts on the new record. So the band, to be clear, is editors. And they're back with their, uh, I think it's their seventh, I want to say, seventh studio album, EBM, uh, which is a pun because uh, this is the first album that they've made with... Um, Chronic bowel Electro movement. <laughs> That's good. It's the first album they've made with... Uh, their regular collaborator the one mr blank mess as an official member of the band uh, he is the not no longer he produced, himself he yeah exactly he produced uh, their last record which was a hot garbage fire of an album <laughs> uh, but now has formally gotten on board to be a part of the creative process and you know what I like this album. I think it's the best album they've made since the back room. And I don't even want to, I, I don't even say, which is their debut for the record. I don't even say that condescendingly. I just genuinely think that this is about as good as this could have possibly been. And there's only one song on here that I would call an outright misfire. And really the, the weaker moments are contained to the kind of final stretch. The first like, sort of six songs on here, really solid stuff. A couple of songs I would even call great. I mean, the thing that makes this record work is that it bangs, basically from front to back. The only real ballad song, uh, well, one of the only real ballad songs is like actually kind of mutates into something much more interesting than just a ballad about halfway through its runtime. So, and everything else on this album is just very, very impactful and propulsive. It kind of has... <coughs> It kind of reminds me a little bit of like 90s Depeche Mode, somewhat New Order to a certain extent. It's like a real full-on dance record. It has like a really propulsive, percussive bent, thanks to the production and the beats of Blank Mass as well, which are really well integrated into what the rest of the band do. No doubt that no one really that I know is going to enjoy this record as much as I do if they even enjoy it at all. But I do think that on a gen genuinely, I think this is, a good album and i one that i will be listening to again and again not just out of like weird a weird sense of of uh 
you know, obligation because of how I've committed to this band discography, but because I do enjoy it. I think it's a very good, very fun. Again, it's I've, it's, I've had no investment in this band. I'm just happy that you got a, a nice ending to this <laughs> whole saga. No, it, and so am I. Like, it's, it's, again, it's, it's not, you know, there's no nutritional uh, value. What was that other album called? It, that was fucking like August described it. He was just like, it's just one of the gayest albums he's ever heard. The probably... weight of your love. Is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah that, that yeah. is, that is to be fair, their worst album. <laughs> the way he just said like, but... this is such a gay album. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, they, they have some pretty fucking gay derogatory music, unfortunately. <laughs> Can I say again? It's very there's very little nutritional value in this. It'll, it'll it's just it'll 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 pass right through you like a cheeseburger. But you know what? Sometimes you just want your music to be a cheeseburger. All right, let's get into the first of our reviews today, which is. The new album from one Mr. Alex G. God Save the Animal. Now, Alex G kind of briefly introduced him at the top of this episode. We'll, we'll go back over it as well. Kind of a musical wonderkind, essentially, like sort of loner figures, essentially, like sat in his bedroom and made albums ever since he was a teenager. He's 29 now. This is his 10th album. Uh, it represents a kind of, he's been on a bit of a streak, I think, ever since 2015's Beach Music. Uh, well, and also 2014's DSU, which is a very big fan favorite album, but with beach music and then definitely with 2017's Rocket, he kind of started moving away from the sort of like, you know, template of just, you know, like distorted, fuzzed out, you know, lo-fi guy, dude with guitar songs and started becoming a bit more of an ambitious artist. Like, uh, I mean, Rocket was like a straight up alt country in a lot of it. And it introduced it, it. And that's, I think, one of the best albums of 2017. That album is super creative, super original, has some just genuinely fucking emotional songs. Like Bobby is to me one of the most emotional songs of the 2010s. Like that song is it's just heartbreaking and like all of his music has always kind of radiated this sort of like lonely queer energy and it's not even a reflection of, of Alex himself like I don't even actually know what Alex's deal is and I don't even feel entitled to know but his music has definitely found an audience and found a place with people in the queer community as well and songs like Bobby and certain songs off of his last album 2019's House of Sugar definitely kind of have that sort of energy and are, are, are powerful and, and easy to connect to for people who've had you know awkward pining experiences coming to terms with their sexuality and all that sort of stuff and on the note of his last record house of sugar i thought that was his best album yet and i still think that i think that album is amazing like that album is just has like four stunning singles essentially and they're all the first four songs on the album as well real like fucking um paramore's brand new eyes type beat which i only really bring up because i listened to that yesterday whatever anyway house of sugar amazing album i think that was like the moment where his particular brand of you know very electronic tinged you know sort of sad boy you know um you know distorted you know it's kind of like um that's a good way of describing it it's like yeah it is kind of like it's, it's like car seat headrests by way of death dynamic shroud you know it's 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 kind of like a confluence of those sorts of things and now we're here again with the follow-up to that which is his new album god save the animals which is like the thing about previous alex g records and this is kind of the the critical narrative i guess that's dominated how this album has been talked about is that his previous records you know they're all they're kind of patchworky like different songs are di in different genres and styles and you're kind of flitting between these different sounds you know from one track to another and it can be a little bit jarring i actually think it really works on those last two records especially but here with god save the animals you have i think what is an active attempt from alex to kind of make the album sort of cohere a bit more and have less i guess jarring shifts in tone between songs and try and have a little bit more of a unified palette which i think is what he goes for on god save the animals and you know it's a fascinating album like i feel simultaneously that alex's songwriting uh both in terms of lyricism and but also in terms of like how he constructs songs is still developing and is sort of getting sharper than ever but also like he's 
slightly kind of becoming a little bit more introverted as a performer as well than he was on some of his last couple of records too. So it's an interesting sort of, you know, development for him. Um, I, I, I like the record a lot. I, I don't like it as much as the last few Alex G records. And it's, I, I believe me, I took my time with it, trying to figure out exactly how I felt in general, because Rocket and House of Sugar, especially are records where it's really difficult for me to explain why I love them the way I do. They're just like, and this is the thing with Alex's music is that it's all like the people who really connect to it. And I count myself in this. It's like, it's really emotional, but also kind of in ways you can't pinpoint. Like it's just this longing that comes through in his music, this melancholy, basically, that is so just infectious and That's contagious. True. And it really like, those are great albums. And this fits into this niche too, like really good albums to listen to when you're just feeling really shit, essentially. And you want to kind of wallow in that a little bit. Uh, and what I think has allowed Alex to kind of maintain a critical foothold and continue continue to kind of be an important artist is that he's never lost sight of how to do that. But at the same time, he's also tried to make his songs more musically embellished and ambitious and full of different sounds and instrumentation. So I think he tries to find a happy medium here. And I think a lot of the time he does do that. Uh, there's like with any Alex G record, there's songs on this that stand up with his absolute best works. I think particularly uh, in the first half of this record as well, some of his best songs in general, I think the first two songs, first three songs actually on this record, I would I would say are some of uh, Alex's best songs in a while. It, it is a record that I feel like what, what I value most in Alex is a kind of sense of unpredictability that his music can give me. I mean, when I think about Rocket, like that, that's an album uh, we're like, I mean, my two favorite songs on that record are Bobby and Sports Star. And Bobby is a kind of like alt country love song jam. And Sports Star is like a kind of purely electronic synth, sad, fucking melancholic crooner song that sounds like the most beautiful thing you've ever heard. And they're completely polar opposites. And I've always kind of loved the way that Alex just kind of has done that. It just kind of, his records are kind of a bit of a patchwork. And it's, it's weird, like, while I get why this record is being praised as something that really unifies all the different things he's really, really good at, I almost kind of miss the vivid kind of sense of danger that those out previous albums gave me. And, and there's points where I think, you know, I, this record is never less than really good, um, but there's just points where I feel like I, 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 I'm getting a little bit less of that... Uh, I don't know, that's that, that immediate connection. That said, you know, there's songs on this thing, like, and I, I love the first three songs. They're probably my three favorites, but there are songs, you know, littered throughout this record that do really, really stand out to me as well, particularly on my most recent listen. I really res responded this morning to the song Immunity as well, which I think is one of his most beautiful songs. And I'll get into like the things I like about them um, and, you know, what I think is great about his minimal but quite emotionally potent lyrical style i'll get into that in a little bit but jake i know you're i i think this is your first alex g album you can correct me if mm -hmm. i'm wrong there it and is. i'd like to hear what your kind of impression is of alex as an artist just off of the base of this off of the basis of this new record i've always meant to get around to albums like house of sugar and i still like want to just because with an artist like this i feel like it's sort of difficult to nail down their progression in a kind of linear narrative because they're so eclectic that it feels almost like it feels like almost a pointless endeavor in many respects but like just the the impression I get from after hearing this album is that he's just a guy with uh, his fingers and many sonic pots. And I can say that largely this does work for me, but it also, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a struggle. I, I think it's just, this is not an album I would describe as being particularly for me. Um, and a lot of it does have to do with some of that minimal lyrical style getting like it has very limited mileage with me i will say that it does work in a sort of way that these kind of fragmentary songs also occasionally do really work my two favorite songs on here being 
uh, After All, which I think is maybe the most immediate thing on here. It has that hook that's just really fucking catchy and really sad as that really satisfying build in the second half where it's got like the the choral of, of pitched up vocals and i just i i love that shit it feels like a really great solid introduction to the album um and i do really like i i think runner is solid too and another one of my favorite songs on here is actually ain't it easy which i think is also maybe one of the more lyrically not dense but at least more detailed things on here and it sort of lets this kind of cloudy dream pop alt americana sound that he has on it's really fucking strange to try and pin down what this album is doing from like a a genre standpoint because it feels wholly unlike anything i've heard in a singular respect and also it doesn't really feel like a lot of the songs are sonically co cohesive with like one another and that does kind of work for the most part where the album kind of loses me is in a lot of these song structures as songs a lot of them just feel really not malformed, but I, I guess maybe half-formed. Uh, stuff like SDOS, for example, which is probably my least favorite song on here. It's just kind of like, I just don't know what I'm meant to feel with this, I, I guess. It's just like this repeated sort of pitch down lyrical refrain and this kind of skeletal instrumental happening that's got like, you know, it's got some interesting textures to it. I think like one of the What's that fucking instrument where you take the little wood stick and then you grind it against the little ribbed wooden thing? I don't know what the fuck, whatever the fuck. But it, it's got some interesting textures here and they collide in semi-compelling ways. But a lot of it is just like, there is like this vague air of melancholy that I'll occasionally get on the wavelength of like on something like After All or Ain't It Easy, which honestly really reminded me of Ginger by Brockhampton. Uh, not just the oh, song, but like the album in no, general. That's a really good reference for someone like Alex I, G. Actually, I think yeah. he's super, like, I think they are super influenced by him, but also you can see a lot of that oh, yeah. in his music. I think about Alex, like, he really blew up because he was on, Frank Ocean's Blonde. Frank Ocean's Blonde. And yeah, Endless. He, that he was played guitar kept... pretty pretty um, uh, frequently on both of those records. And then that sort of, I think that experience, not only did it give him more attention, but it also kind of colored, you know, the the very sort of, I would say not formless, but sort of like you know, amorphous style he kind of adopted moving in terms of moving away from the standard, like lo-fi dude with the guitar kind of thing. And it's made him into a more compelling figure, I think, but also kind of given him a little bit of a, you know, not everyone's going to get on board with it because it isn't very immediate music and it's kind of deliberately sort of fragmentary. I'm I'm deliberately trying not to use the word vibe, but you get what I'm saying. I, I mean, that's the thing, though, is that I feel like that's kind of what this music is trying to accomplish. And that's a valid goal to have. It's just that his influences are almost so eclectic that it just, it, it, it just sort of ceases to cohere sometimes. There are songs on here like, Cross the sea where like the beginning of it is like fine and then like the second half of it just dissolves and becomes a completely different thing it just kind of explodes and that like moment is singularly captivating and then it just kind of becomes like a puddle of noise at the end and it's just kind of like whoosh and that, that a lot of the second half of this album has that problem for me where it remains compelling by sheer creativity and because Alex is clearly a very talented musician with lots of interesting things going on but the minimal lyrical vibe here sort of adding to the sort of scattershot sound makes it really difficult for me to emotionally grab onto anything here because like again you have something like after all which had very much has no halo by Brockhampton vibes <laughs> um it's not as you know confessional and like straightforward as something like that is but it contains all of the sonic signifiers of that brand of you know sad boy atmospheric pop music and occasionally his sort of dalliances into more daring palettes are are interesting but this album is also sort of constantly in a flux of like fighting itself between being for me at least lyrically and sonically captivating because my favorite moments on here are when it's both at the same time 
but it's so all over the place that it's very rarely ever both. So especially on that second half where you have more minimal ideas like um, headroom piano or um, I'm not particularly fond of immunity myself. Like it's, it's fine, but it's also just sort of a part where I'm like, I, I like it, but I have to kind of struggle to push myself to feel anything during it. And it just sort of feels like if you told me this was like a collection of Alex G B sides, I would probably believe you um, just because it, it doesn't, feel like there's a overarching thematic thing and even though it's lyrically minimal I still feel like you can accomplish a level of cohesion that gets that across as someone who again loves the last two Alex G records I, I I'm in a fairly similar boat I, I do think that this is just not quite it hasn't quite arrived for me and I have spent a lot of time this week with it Again, I think there's amazing moments on this album. I, I genuinely love After All and Runner, especially like Runner is just like, it's just one of those classic Alex G songs to me. Like he's got a really powerful vocal performance on this song. And I, I love as well, like Alex, you know, for someone who seems to approach songwriting in such a, you know, what, what someone less charitable might call a throwaway manner. Like these are immaculately, you know, constructed songs from a sheer sonic perspective like the, the record sounds fantastic i think and he's really yeah. great at, at fleshing out and building a sound that's quite you know satisfying to sit with it never fe feels as though the record is rough around the edges sonically or malformed in that sense but the songs just don't always uh, leave the impression that um they do i think with more frequency on previous records um but yeah i i, I like I, I will say, and this is not something I think Alex achieves consistently, maybe he doesn't shoot for it consistently, but I do tend to gravitate, gravitate the most to the songs where I get, I, I feel at least a clear sense of an emotional, uh, if not narrative, then at least kind of like tableau or scene or setting. Like one of the reasons why I love Immunity is that it's a very simple song and it's just about like, hiding a, uh, essentially a drug problem from members of your family essentially and having to make up excuses and you just get these kind of like little fragments of uh the scenes in this very mundane day where these things are happening and it, it, it has this kind of quite evocative effect especially in its incompleteness because i guess the incompleteness feels like it's it's fitting for the sort of story that's being told and the sort of protagonist that's inhibiting it. And then you get other moments like Miracles, for instance, where Alex is writing in a bit more of a conventional way. Uh, and, and I find it quite, it's quite moving. And I think that's one of the moments where the record really picks up musically again as well. But yeah, it, it is just an album that has, like a lot of Alex's records, tries to do a lot of things. And I mean, the mo probably the most sort of, memorable or ambitious moment on here is no bitterness which sort of turns into this like weird sort of club you know drum and bass influence yeah. thing in its second half which i quite you know i i i don't know that i love the way it's executed but i really admire it and i think it is one of the record's more memorable moments but again i just tend to gravitate a bit more to when alex is really throwing caution to the wind and just kind of leaning into these more weirder moments which i think he does do better on other records but look regardless it's a good record i listened to it heaps this week um even if i think my opinion has kind of gone down a little bit on it um after a bunch of listens i still enjoy it and i still think that um you know at least a good half of the songs here are really re really do hold up and the rest um i don't think there's really anything bad here i could definitely do without sdos or headroom piano but basically everything else i think is varying degrees of good and I like I, I am always keen to see where Alex goes. And I, I think that this is um it's cool to see him continuing to get more, you know, appreciation and respect. I read an interview with him this week and I was really taken with how like just incredibly humble he is as a person. Like he just every time he makes a record, he's just convinced that no one at all is going to like it. And he's so taken aback when he when his records are positively received and he seems this like a really certainly really... music that i listened to and i was just like i bet this dude's real chill to hang out with yeah I, he's a guy who just doesn't really seem to make music for anyone but himself i i think i, I genuinely Respect, just, honestly i genuinely just don't think that he really factors in mass appeal at all to anything that he does 
Um, but he also doesn't try to be deliberately kind of, you know, he doesn't try to deliberately obfuscate his songwriting skill either. He's just, he, he hits happy medium. And he's, again, I also think that as well for a particular demographic of people who are, you know, probably in their age between like sort of 18 and 23. Like he, he just yeah. he hits upon a, a vibe and a feeling in his music that just makes it connect a lot, I think, with that demographic. Um, so yeah, a good album. Uh, I think that I will probably be going back to some of his earlier records more more than this one from this point onwards. But I'm glad it exists, and I'm glad that people seem to be getting a lot out of it. All right, for favorite tracks and ratings, then for God Save the Animals, Jake, you go first. All right, my three favorite tracks on here: After All, Ain't It Easy, and Runner. Least favorite is probably SDOS, uh, and I give the album a six. All right, my three favorite songs on here are after all runner and immunity my least favorite is headroom piano i think and i'll give this a 6.5 which overall gives us an average of 6.3 for alex g's god save the animals all right let's move into our second review of the day which is of course The new album from the Wonder Years, The Hum Goes On Forever. This is the seventh album from the legendary Philadelphia pop punk, alt rock, indie, emo band, The Wonder Years. It is, uh, and then this is a band that have had a fascinating progression, a band that have meant a lot to us, as we sort of highlighted at the top of this episode. You know, we reviewed their sort of seminal you know, breakthrough album, 2013's The Greatest Generation. We That was our 100th record club, a great video that I'm very, very proud of that you can go and check out. And that was kind of the the moment where they kind of found the sort of pinnacle of what they were doing, essentially. They kind of like realized the fullest version of who they were as this particular you know, style of sort of pop punk band that d- sort of do fit in the mold somewhere between the Menzingers and the Gaslight Anthem, but also like doing their own thing, pulling a lot from early 2000s pop punk bands like Jimmy Eat World and all that sort of thing. You know, our bread and butter, basically. And that was a great record. That was a seminal album. And as was 2015's No Closer to Heaven, the follow-up to that record, and 2018's Sister Cities, which saw the band sort of going in a different direction, kind of eschewing some of the more sort of emo aspects that had come to define their sound, heading in a little bit more of a kind of alt-rock direction. And here we're back at kind of, it's almost like Return to Square One in a certain sense with The Hum Goes On Forever, which feels like a record that is so the wonder years you know what i mean like it's like it is the the Mm -hmm. wonder years kind of like taking stock essentially and making the most wonder years album they could possibly make you know it's really interesting like i have to wonder when they play shows now i have to wonder how dan campbell feels you know singing passing through a screen door and, and having to sing those lines you know jesus christ i'm 26 all the people i graduated with have kids and wives and here yeah. he is you know here he is basically 10 years on and he is he's the family man now right and and he is in the stage of life that you know all pop punkers get to eventually where it's no longer about you know that you know disillusioned isolation that you kind of put yourself into in your 20s but now you do have a family and now all of a sudden you're accountable for and have to consider all sorts of things that you know weren't really a part of your life and that is kind of the defining aspect of the hum goes on forever right it is the the pop punk dude settles down album and what's great about it is that it is you know it's heavily front loads those concerns and really speaks from that particular perspective but doesn't lose any of the real identity or feeling of the earlier records as well it's like re- revisiting or giving a re-update on the emotions of albums like greatest generation no closer to heaven from this new perspective of someone who's now viewing all of this through the lens of being a father through the lens of being a husband through the lens of someone who has you know essentially had to settle for the sake of the people he loves the most and so this is a record that i was as heavily preoccupied with Dan's own internal state and mindset about that and about being in this position now. And I think nowhere is this more clearly and powerfully displayed than my favorite song on the record, which is 
well, I, th- I don't know if it was a lead single, but it was definitely an early single, Wyatt's song, uh, which I think is just, it's like the best encapsulation of this album and of where the Wonder Years are at at this point, you know? A song about being completely devoted to your child, essentially, to the point where they have become your entire world. And the way that you view your artistic identity, the way you review your place in the world is now filtered through the presence of this, you know, foundational aspect of your life now. And yeah, so the whole record kind of blossoms outward from that, I think, as its kind of central thesis statement. But anyway, I'm not the most involved or bigger, even the biggest Wonder Years fan here. Morgan, Jake, what are your thoughts on how the band have represented their sound here in 2022 with this album? And what do you think of it overall? I feel like The Home Goes On Forever, it almost feels like a comeback record from a band who's been gone way longer than they actually have. Naturally, this has been exacerbated by the pandemic a lot of which this record is preoccupied with. Yeah, four years since Sister Cities. And in some ways, this does feel almost like a return to form, I guess, Uh, for the one years it it sound. This record, I think, in a lot of places, sounds a lot like the suburbia and the greatest generation era of the Wonder Years and less Snow Closer to Heaven and Sister Cities. And I've seen this referred to as a regression. I mean, musically, maybe, but all of the musicians in this band are so profoundly proficient at their crafts at this point that, like, a regression to what exactly? Extremely skilled, hook-laden songwriting. I think there are plenty of moments that retain the journey that No Closer to Heaven and Sister Cities took this band on. This is evident in moments like the sequel to a track on uh, No Closer to Heaven, Cardinals 2, which I think it feels both like a development on and a hearkening back to that particular era for this band. And in so doing, it kind of creates something new. Because I don't think this song in particular really fits on Sister Cities or No Closer to Heaven. The the moments on the album, like the aforementioned uh, Wyatt song, Old Friends Like Lost Teeth, which is maybe the single most Wonder Years song title one yeah. could dream up, Oldest Daughter. You know, uh, songs like that feel very at home for this band, uh, but in a way that feels like they've kind of been gone forever. And at least from my perspective, you're very happy to see them. It's like a sort of warm blanket in those moments. The sound of the record, I think, is as impeccable as, well, you know, Sister Cities kind of notwithstanding, as impeccable as Suburbia, The Greatest Generation, and No Closer to Heaven have been. Uh, I think this definitely sort of gets back to that particular level of just really great dynamic sounding pop punk records and addressing really the only drawback of sister cities i feel naturally that's that's great to see because i think that it does really help out a lot of the songs on this record which like wyatt's song in particular i think is so loud (laughs) And it just makes it hit that much harder when Campbell is is just basically hollering in the pre-chorus, when I drove you home, uh, listening to God Only Knows. I feel like, I, I don't know, maybe that's the only joy I've ever felt in the past 10 years. Hard to say. Yeah, what's... The sound of it at that moment, it is, it's absolutely soaring. That's real. I've heard people say that this album is brick walled. And I just want to ask these people, have you heard rock music ever sound even remotely loud before? That's all this, this isn't, what are you, ta- I, what are you talking about? See, it's really interesting when people start using like words that are just descriptions of mixing styles as pejoratives like because it just exactly. gets really confusing 
because this is a record that has a dense mix right there's a lot happening in these songs uh-huh. more than you might even think initially like they're loud songs they are really loud they're re- mixed and recorded to be a very very loud and like i can understand you know what whatever if it's not your thing cool fine whatever but i i yeah just be you use your words <laughs> better is all i'm saying think about them anyway look, Jesus. this is a as an album i think uh, i concur basically with most of what morgan has said i think that it is you know it's it's you know, as great as sister cities was it was a record that could feel a bit fatiguing in terms of its intensity of uh and that came down to to mixing decisions as well whereas i think this has a little bit more dynamics in it it's just a little bit smoother as well it, it feels like a lot more akin to how a record like no closer to heaven sounds and uh, I, I think as well, it's maybe like the least risky uh, record the Wonder Years have made. Not that they've ever really been a, ma- a band that take risks. And I don't think that's a problem. Uh, but I do think that some people who maybe wanted to see, who I could understand wanting to essentially see the Wonder Years do something akin to evolve their sound in a way that's akin to kind of how they evolved it with Sister Cities. I could see them wanting that, that expectation being there for a new Wonder Years record after this amount of time. But really, like the overall impression I get while listening to it is it's kind of like it's a relief to hear a band like this who are obviously, you know, with pop punk bands, especially like the, 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 these aren't bands that have longevity, right? Because they are, you know, so much of the identity of the music is wrapped up in a specific stage of life, right? So when you get beyond that stage of life, it can be very difficult for a band, like you can have a bit of an identity crisis, right? It can be very difficult for a band to sort of figure out how to do what they do best in a way that doesn't feel incongruous, right? Or just inappropriate, right? I think band, you know, the best bands do figure out how to negotiate this. Like the Menzingers figured out how to negotiate that. Um, Jimmy Eat World figured out, out how to negotiate that. You know, they every record essentially, once you get past a certain threshold, every record becomes a bigger challenge than the last, essentially, because you're attempting to maintain the appeal that you've always had and speak with a particular voice that you've always had and, you know, speak to particular themes that you always have while your life is moving further and further away from the time that defined those themes. So what the Wonder Years are trying to do here is it's they're, they're walking a very difficult tightrope in a certain sense. And I think, you know, the overarching decision here is to kind of try and not to walk the tightrope and just to kind of make a record that sounds, has a sort of classic Wonder Years sound. Essentially rehashes a lot of, you know, common Wonder Years themes, but also integrates some of the aspects of Dan's sort of current life as well. You know, like, you know, being a father now, that sort of thing. And, you know, like most of the Wonder Years music, I find this the most moving when it is at its most personal, right? When you get to feel like, you're getting an insight and you know uh, the the song that really strikes strikes me like when i think about this record and when i first heard it as well the song that kind of like you know it, it kind of felt almost like i shouldn't be hearing it was laura in the beehive where it's like it's just this is just legitimately a song that it's just like dan addressing essentially people in his life you know that he doesn't speak to as much or that maybe are concerned about him based on the music that he makes or based on the art that he does and essentially you know it, it's a very meta song in a certain sense because it's like confronting that through the guise of another song essentially so adopting this framework that you know draws concern from people to then address those concerns and then to you know package that as something that becomes a part of you know the album and the album identity as well it's like there's layers of intimacy and meta narrative to it that makes it kind of like almost difficult to like listen to at certain points you feel like you shouldn't be privy to this information but also like because dan is the songwriter he is he's able to turn that into like a chorus that feels like you know, something we can all you know, relate to or sing along to or feel deeply, you know, I can just call to talk about the weather or anything you want. I just called to hear your voice. I'm sorry I won't keep you on. Like he has the ability to take, you know, something which is essentially, you know, constructed, but still like a very personal sentiment from one person to another and turn that into something that is all of a sudden a rallying cry, you know, that we can all sing along to when we think about, you know, the people we care about and you know how they might be concerned about us and how you know we deal with or process their concerns while also dealing with the own sh- the, the shit that we've got going on because you know one of the worst parts of being you know in a really shit place 
mentally is the additional added stress of having to worry about how you're stressing out people who care about you in ways that you can't help. So like that's a powerful moment on the record as well. It's a moment that I think really, really, really comes, you know, it really hits home for me. Another song is Cardinals 2 as well. The, you know, the sequel to the, the, the standout from No Closer to Heaven, right? Like this is a, it's a fucking brutal song, dude. It's like the level of self-blame and, you know, it's just, hate self-hatred that kind of comes through here especially like when you've come at it off the back of you know Wyatt's song and oldest daughter which are songs about being strong for people in your life who need you to be strong right and then you get cardinals 2 coming through and it's just pure just weakness it's pure like I'm, I'm a complete fuck up like my favorite moment on this entire record is at the very end the way that he kind of like he just the way he just fucking hammers on that i fucked it all up it's just so brutal it's just god it hurts so much fuck and i think that's really what separates it more so from the greatest generation in suburbia not exactly happy records but they always sound hopeful and energized even in their lamentations and the way that this record sounds is very adult i think it sort of creates the feeling that you were running out of time to be this way because other people are depending on you in a very serious way and in so many ways you're happy you're the happiest and most content that you've ever been but also the world is falling apart around you and you can't you can't even really process that because you have to help out the people around you with processing that. So you become secondary in that moment. And it's almost even worse than it used to be when it was just you. Mm. Yeah. And that's like the pervading emotion. <laughs> remember, right? It's just like, I feel as shit as I did when I wrote this album, this album, this album. But now I have this additional layer where it's like, and I, I need to be better and it's not even just for me anymore and it adds that like uh, just real urgency to it that that you know makes it eh, like i hate to use words like mature and all that sort of shit because it's it's it tends to be misleading and also kind of reductive but like this is like the most you know adult album this band have made yet so far and it's like really dealing with specific adult concerns you know things that don't necessarily become a big part of your life or a big concern until you're like you know you're out of a certain age or you're in a certain situation and all of a sudden like your responsibilities are so intense i mean it's not as if the record does disguises i mean the, the opening song begins with just i don't want to die like the doors are painted shut the opener is just like it's completely just it, it, it's like you know they're not dressing anything up really here like the emotions there is no are, pretense exactly their emotions are like maybe if not if not as much up front as they've always been maybe even more so like there's just points where it feel like and i love when dan is great at doing this as well because it's a difficult thing to do well is it sometimes like the poeticism is just impossible to keep up and he just has to say things like everything's so fucking dark you found me crying in the other room it's been years since i've been low like this i don't like it it, it feels like the progression from early twilight sad to like uh <laughs> yeah yes, the, you know yeah the fucking... it's, it's good this has actually got a lot of what's the, the same... 2019 record yeah, called i'm, I'm getting having a story be like this all the time this is such, Thank got you. such a similar energy to that album because that is an album as well about like you know you know, James Graham is a father for the first, that's the first record where he's a father, where he's in like a committed relationship where he has these responsibilities that go beyond himself. And he has to figure out a way to reconcile his state of mind with that, you know, and it's, it's an ugly album. It's maybe a little bit uglier than this because he says things that, you know, I, I feel like he needed to get out, but he also probably won't look forward to when his kids are old enough to actually listen to those songs. Whereas, you know, this is a little bit more wholesome. <laughs> 
Wyatt's song is kind yeah. of like it's the sort of song that you know I you know if my dad wrote the song for me I would like it would be dad of the year every year because like it, it's yeah it's I I I I love this song so much like this the hook to the yeah. song has been running through my head all week and it's just I I I love it I love it so much <laughs> like just the the things to the shit in this song I'm sure like if slash when i'm eventually appearing it'll be like a million times more intense but like the shit where he's like you learn to say moon so we wave from your room you called to it like it might come to you like (laughs) if you have a kid i don't know how to feel if you have a kid it hurts on that level if you don't have a kid it hurts on the level that it makes you remember what it was like to be a kid and to be that young and to be that fucking naive and either way it makes you feel like shit uh summer clothes i think is another song that does this really really well too it has that whole like um you know the final verse of this is kind of just like it's so f- straight off the Phoebe Bridgers Punisher playbook. Uh, we're fo- floating on our backs. We're staring at the stars or the ones we can see through the light pollution. Then we all pretend that if we squint real hard, we can make out the shape of the space station and some lonely astronaut will smile back at us. Like this song is so like revisiting, you know, it's being 35 and then going back to a, a place that you were when you were 15 and trying to, and living inside that moment again. And yeah all of time kind of collapsing onto you look i can't pretend to be old enough to really get all of this i'm only 25 but i already am at, i already feel a lot that you know time is sort of starting to collapse in terms of like my life like time is starting to mean less and less and less and you know something that happened to me yesterday and something that happened to me 10 years ago might as well have been be the same amount of distance away from me you know if that makes any sense and this record is like so that 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 feeling is so embedded in this as well that sense of like you know the older you get the less time seems to mean anything and you realize like how much you've grown up because you've had to but also how little you have actually grown up and and how many different ways you're still a child and that subtext here as well that i i think is you know, makes the songs about, that are explicitly about children even more, you know, of a, like, working on all these different layers. Well, uh, it's kind of anticlimactic to sort of end uh, after that, but I'm in a precarious place with this album where I think it's consistently great the whole way through. I have no noticeable weak points or even really any substantial issues with it. It's just also an album that it's the Wonder Years leaning back on the things that they are good at. And I enjoy that because of course I do. And I do like the perspective with which this is written. This is a seasoned sort of wizened perspective that, you know, you can tell the band not only as musicians, but, you know, as writers have, you know, one up a little bit and they're a bit older now. And I feel like this is appealing to, even more so than before, this is sort of appealing to the sort of Menzinger's core of like, you know, people who are aged slightly, who are singing about the fact that they are that way. It's not just about, you know, singing about the trials and tribulations of being young anymore. It's about being younger, but still like looking back with it with a with a measure of of maturity um, that I think, you know, infinitely relatable. And I I guess I'm totally going to be like one of the rare psychopaths that prefers an album like Sister Cities to this, just because I have a really strong attachment to something like that. But also just because I, you know, I admired what they did on their sort of leap forward with No Closer to Heaven as being like a bit more, I guess, ambitious than, you know, a pop punk band like them would be a move like them that would be expected to make. And I feel like Sister Cities was kind of a double down on that um, in terms of like, it just sort of felt like it sort of filled out the gaps in terms of alternative rock as a whole, more than like specifically pop punk. Like, you know, there are parts on that album that are just more ballad-esque or just, you know, more, I mean, fuck, Sister Cities is more common with a Death Cab for Cutie album than it does an actual, like, you know, pop punk record. And again, I, I can't fault them for going back and leaning on their strengths at all. It's just that 
I, I can't in good conscience say that this album has the structural or thematic uniformity of something like The Greatest Generation that I think makes that as holistically satisfying as that is. And it doesn't have the sort of sonic signifiers of something that's a bit more interesting, like No Closer to Heaven and Sister Cities. And it does feel a little bit more like suburbia. And that's totally fine. But it's just an album that sort of feels like it it, it doesn't really... Like it has a sort of updated thematic core to it, but it doesn't feel that wholly different from the material that the band were coming out with before to the point where like, I just sort of struggle to broadly reconcile this within their like trajectory as artists. And that's a really fucking pompous way to look at this album, but it's it, it, it's very, it's been very difficult trying to be like, oh, I really like this album and don't think it drags. I think that it's like, you know, it's tight. It's It's got a, you know, great track list full of songs I love. Cardinals 2 is, you know, one of those, that's a real call in your shot moment when you make a, a direct sequel to probably my favorite song that you've ever made. And then you pull a fucking getting sodas shit at the very end where you just interpolate the song again. And that's just one of the best moments on any song all year, frankly. And that, you know, the album's not done with great moments after that. But like as a whole, it's like this is a great Wonder Years album, but it's also like I, I, I struggle to give it an identity beyond that and that's fine it's not necessarily a shortcoming but it's also just like i i i guess i just the 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 connective tissue here isn't as strong as it is with other records they have uh, for me personally i guess hey look i actually probably agree more than you might think like i i like this record a good deal i i would agree with you i think i like sister, sister cities a bit more if i'm to kind of pair them up together I do think like this record's biggest weakness is that it kind of peaks really early and it has a lot of great songs dotted throughout the rest of it, but also, you know, some songs that don't really, I think, have as much impact or lasting memorability for me, like Paris of Nowhere, songs about death. Um, I'm actually not hugely into old friends like Lost Teeth. Um, there's nothing on here I don't enjoy, but I do feel like it is a record that has moments that really capture what it's about really, really well. And as opposed to being like a consistent flooring back to front singular experience, like the last three records are for me in its best moments, like this is pure wonder years, euphoria and complicated emotions. And, and I like the way that it updates that state of mind for where Dan is at right now, but it is ultimately like, I, I don't think I'm ever going to get the same pure adrenal and joy from a new wonder years record as i get from you know uh greatest generation and no closer to heaven and i'm perfectly fine with that i just want them to keep making yeah. records and here they have and it's a good one it, so if anything it is simply a monument to this band's consistency that like even when i don't think they're churning out the absolute pinnacle of their material they don't drop the ball for even a second all right Shall we do our favorite tracks and ratings then? I'll go first this time. Uh, my three favorite tracks are going to be Wyatt's song for sure. Uh, you know, I actually just think it's that three song run of Wyatt's song, Oldest Daughter and Cardinals 2. Uh, my least favorite is probably Songs About Death. And I'm going to give the album a 6.5 three favorite sides i will say oldest daughter uh that was one of the early singles and it's been in heavy rotation ever since then i will also shout out the paris of nowhere uh which is just like so classic wonder years and i just mm -hmm. it's 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 one of the moments on the album that i was immediately just like yes Absolutely. When so much of the album, even the singles that have been around for months or weeks now, have been sort of a, you know, there's there's been a getting to know you stage with those. Uh, but on that note, I will also shout out. 
because like I'm, I'm stuck between Wyatt's song, Old Friends Like Lost Teeth, Be the Reason I Don't Want the World to End. Uh, I don't know, fuck it, one of those three. Least favorite, I will say songs about death, which I, I, I like a lot, but it feels a little undercooked compared to everything else. I think it hits really hard when it does in fact hit, but it's, it just sort of, it's a little meandering and I like that it's meandering, but I also, it's, it's a weird song and I'm not a hundred percent. And overall, I will give this a nine out of 10. It's, I'm not, I'm not sure I would put it over sister cities even either, but it's one of my favorite releases of the year. Um, and I've just enamored with it. Well, my three favorite tracks going to go with, uh, Cardinals 2, the rare sequel that is almost as good as the original. Uh, gotta go with Wyatt's song, Parenthetical Your Name. That's a fucking killer hook. And uh, I want to say Low Tide. Um, that's been a song yeah, that I've song. always really been looking forward to in the back half of the track list. Yeah. And at least favorite, I i don't really have one i i really do think this is an album that just kind of like yeah it's got its higher points but it just kind of goes and it don't stop going uh i give it a 7.5 all right which gives us an average overall of 7.7 for the wonder years the hum goes on forever let us know at home what you think of either of the albums we've discussed today, Alex G's God Save the Animals or The Wonder Years, The Hum Goes On Forever. We want to hear from you in the comments below. Plus, if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel if you have not already. Both of those things help us out a huge amount. Plus, if you want to go above and beyond and support us, you can for just $1 a month at the join button, become a member of the Jams and Tea family, support us directly, get your name in the title call of every video on this channel. Plus, if you want to recommend us some music to listen to and talk about on the show, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. As always, though, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Levi's. Quality never goes out of style.